morning, good morning, good morning. Welcome, please come in. Uh, before we uh, actually start this morning, uh, we will be participating, Lord willing, in communion this morning. On your way in, uh, if you are taking communion this morning, then uh, you should have received uh, this uh, packet. Uh, the packet that you have has uh, the bread on top and the cup obviously underneath. There is a clear plastic wrapper that holds the bread. The bread is just that circle on the top and the clear wrapper has the Bible verse written on it. And so at the appropriate time, uh, then you'll unwrap the bread, you'll unwrap the cup. Uh, at, after that, then uh, Carissa will be playing an instrumental, and the deacons will come and will pass down the open aisle in front of you, and you will drop your uh, receptacle, your cup, into that trash can. And then after the deacons have cleared, uh, the sanctuary of all of that, then we'll actually sing the song after our communion time together. So basically, here's your cup. The bread is on the top underneath a clear wrapper. The contents of the cup, obviously, underneath uh, the, the, the spout side of your cup. That's where the easy peel is for that. Uh, we'll be taking that as we uh, enter into our service time after a couple of songs. Uh, that being the case, then uh, I'll remind you uh, what the Apostle Paul uh, said that we are to do, and that is that we are to examine ourselves. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 28 says, But a man must examine himself, and in so doing, he is to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. And so as we prepare for this communion time, you want to prepare your heart as well uh, for a meaningful remembrance of communion. Uh, if you are joining us at home, then we invite you at this time to get your elements ready. Uh, that means that uh, if you have uh, some bread or cracker or whatever it is that you have, uh, and then if you have uh, juice or even water, uh, you want to have those things out and ready to receive communion together this morning. Uh, welcome, my name is John Ely. I'm the pastor here at Falmouth Baptist Church. Uh, Tim Rogers will be coming up, uh, Pastor Tim, to, to give the message uh, later. But we've gathered here to have our hearts focused upon our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the salvation that is available in Him, and the fellowship we have as uh, one in the body of Christ. And with that in mind, would you join me in a word of prayer? Heavenly Father, we stand before you amazed that you are such a loving Heavenly Father. You have created everything there is, including each one of us. And everything is to give you glory. Help us, Father, uh, to approach you with faith in Jesus Christ as our Savior, indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God, led in our relationship with you, by your word, let us come to you, Father, with thankful hearts and acknowledge that Jesus is the only one who saves. He is the Messiah. Now, Father, we give you our very selves. We thank you for giving us your son. We pray it in Jesus' name and all of God's people say, Amen. Will you please rise and sing with us?
relationship with God the Father through Jesus the Son, it's not by anything that we could do. It's not by something uh, that we do in terms of our affiliations, not the family we were born in, the church we belong to. It's not our relationship with God the Father because any action that we took, it's not a prayer that you prayed, it's not a baptism that you underwent. It's simply this, faith alone in the finished work of Christ alone. And it's the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, the word of God says. That's unmerited favor, the grace of God that he gives to us. And the way that you receive that free gift of God, forgiveness of sins and eternal life, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, the scripture says. And so that means I put all my hope for eternity, for the forgiveness of sins, for the possession of eternal life, a forever relationship with God. All of my hope is in Jesus, the Messiah. And I receive that free gift, the amazing love, the amazing grace of Jesus, the Savior. <laughs>
once again, we're going to be prepared to take communion. Uh, and the mechanics of the communion, a little bit different for us this morning, and that is that uh, you received this packet when you came in. There is a clear film that is over the white wafer that is on the top of the cup. And so that clear wrapper is peeled back, and you want to be careful not to have the wafer drop out <laughs> and go someplace. Uh, you then will take the bread when I instruct you, and then after that, you go to the spout side of the cup, the pointy side, and you can uh, make that tab lift up carefully and steadily for uh, receiving of the cup, the juice that's inside. After you've completed that, then you will hold that in your hand and the deacons will come to you in the empty row between our rows. And uh, then while you are not singing, uh, you are simply dropping that container into the wastebasket that they have provided for you. And then uh, you'll know that the worship team will start singing and then you can uh, join in that singing at that time. So that's the mechanics. If at any time you have difficulty, if you just put up a hand and say, hey, I'm having difficulty, uh, if you already know that, that that might be a trouble for you, maybe you, you want to have somebody seated next to you, a family member, uh, if there's not a family member present, we'll have somebody come help you with the unwrapping of uh, those containers. All right. Let's uh, begin with a word of prayer and then focus our hearts upon the remembrance of our Lord and Savior Jesus. Father in heaven, thank you for Jesus, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The good news of the gospel is that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. He took our place. And we're here to remember that great sacrifice of love by our Savior Jesus. All our hope, our faith is in Jesus. All our love is rightly given to Jesus. Thank you for Jesus the Savior. Come now, Father, and speak to us during this time of remembrance through these simple elements, whether we take them here in the sanctuary or wherever we are, we remember Jesus. We thank you for eternal life in his name. We pray this in Jesus' name with thanksgiving. Communion is that look back on the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. That without that sacrifice, there could be no forgiveness of sins. The scripture is clear that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And the wages of sin, that which justly is paid out because of sin, the wages of sin is death. And it's contrasted with eternal life. So that we know that the scripture is speaking about eternal separation. That's the wages of sin. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And so as we come to this point, we are looking back at the sacrifice of Christ. At the same time, uh, the scripture says that we are one body. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We are all part of the body of Christ. And God has arranged the parts of the body just as he would have them. And so communion is a look around. And this is a marvelous communion. It's our first communion uh, since uh, the quarantine. And we thank God for the fellowship of believers, brothers and sisters in Christ, those who are near and those who are far away. But communion is not something I do just as a relational event between me and my Savior Jesus, but a relational event with brothers and sisters in Christ, the body of Christ with faith in Jesus Christ. As we've already said, communion is a time to examine ourselves. As the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, we ought to examine ourselves. See, are we in the faith? Have we trusted Jesus Christ as our Savior? It's also a time that we look at that relationship. My relationship with God through Jesus Christ. My time in the Word, my time in prayer, my great
growing in grace. I reflect on that relationship by turning inward. And I understand that all sins, past, present, and future, are forgiven in the cross of Jesus Christ. So there's that look within. At the same time, most hopefully, there's a look ahead. The Apostle Paul will say at the end of the passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, for as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we remember the Lord's death until he shall come again. Jesus is coming again. Can I get an amen? amen. Today could be the day. And Jesus wanted us to have this remembrance. So that we would be looking forward. And Christians now more than ever before need to be forward looking in faith in Christ. His salvation, his security, his certain return. With that in mind, would you prepare your heart to be joined together in this remembrance of communion. And the night he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took the bread and gave thanks. Deacon Dave Robbins comes forward to give thanks to him for the bread. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we have a Father in heaven who loves us so much. A Father who sacrificed his one and only son for us, even though we are sinners. One who gives us grace and mercy which we don't deserve. We thank you that there is such a loving God. And Father, as we take of these elements, and it has been a while, but I pray that each one of us has not forgotten the importance of them, and it's something we practice daily and remember daily the sacrifice of your Son, Jesus Christ, that he did on that cross for each one of us. But without his sacrifice, without him being the sacrificial lamb, we would all be slaughtered. Because of the love of the Father and the love of the Son, we have salvation through the blood of our Savior, Jesus Christ. As we partake of this bread, let us remember the price that he paid on the cross for each one of us. And may we give thanks in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. You just peel back that wrapper and gently slide out your wafer. Jesus said, this is my body. Do this in remembrance. The same way after supper, the Lord Jesus took the cup. Deacon Sam Lumba comes to give thanksgiving for the cup. Let's pray. Father God, it's indeed our privilege uh, to gather here in this place. Thank you for my brothers and sisters here. This place is a place of love. Thank you for your Holy Spirit that abides with us, comforts us in these difficult times. We thank you, Father, that our home is in heaven. In your Son, we made sure of that. Thank you for his sacrifice. The cup that is before us, that represents the blood of the new covenant. And we thank you for this covenant that you've made with us that you, Father, have forgiven our sins because of the sacrifice made on the cross. You so loved us, and yet we were not deserving. Thank you for this beautiful expression of the God that you are. Help us, Father, to live each day remembering the sacrifice that was made for us. He died so that we could live. Help us to live that abundant life that he's given us. And to remember this world is not our home. Our home is in heaven. And we wish to bring many with us. Help us to share the good news with those around us. Especially in these times. When so many are looking for the answer. And our Lord Jesus is the answer. May we share a testimony of love. 
May we show God's love for those around us. Thank you again for the body of Christ, and thank you for these elements that remind us that we were once dead, but now we're alive in him. And we have purpose, help us to live the life you've called us to live, and to love one another, and most of all, to love you with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 We'll open up the container slowly, gently. Just until it opens up. Drink. Jesus said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for the forgiveness of sin. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he shall come again. The deacons are going to wait upon the worship team and those in the congregation this morning. You just hold your cup until they come. singing Lamb of God. Thank you. 
are so thankful to the Lamb of God, Jesus. Thank you for his salvation, his love, his watch care, and the certainties of his coming again. Thank you for Jesus. We pray this in Jesus' name, and all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. At this time, Pastor Tim is uh, coming forward, and the worship team will be back at that point. You may be seated. for our time in the scriptures this morning. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you again that we can be here in your house, Lord. We thank you that we can be called children of God. Father, we pray for this church. We thank you for this church. Father, you've helped us get through these difficult times. We're thankful that we can be here in person worship as well as online. We pray for all that are listening this morning one way or another. Father, you are a good God, and we look forward to hearing from what you've laid on Pastor Tim's heart. Father, as we look into your word, we thank you for him and for all he's done and for his family. We thank you for Pastor John and his family, Lord. We thank you for the leadership of this church. Father, we've had trying times, but we've been strong because we are united in the love of your son, Jesus Christ. We pray in all these things in the name of Jesus as, as Pastor Tim brings the word. Again, you just bless him and use him in a mighty way. Let us hear from you, Lord, today. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, so uh, I've learned, and, and I'm sure you, you already know this, but uh, I've learned that uh, that you uh, you learn more from from listening than you do from talking. Uh, somebody wisely observed, and who knows how long ago, right? The Lord gave us two ears. And one mouth, and we should listen twice as much as we uh, as we talk. I found that to be to be true uh, in my own life, and it's amazing you can continue to learn to be a better listener uh, the, the longer you live. Uh, and so, uh, I think it's amazing that uh, that we can find uh, uh, find out things by listening in our community and in our culture. We listen to the chatter online. We listen to you know uh, things in the in the news and whatnot, um, and uh, people are concerned, right? We do live in a trying time, as, as Deacon David said, and people are concerned. Uh, people have told me that they're concerned about things. People have approached me, not just online and, and whatnot. People talk to me about the, the concerns that, that they have. You know, the world today, is, they're concerned for Christianity. Christianity is, uh, is, is attacked from, from all over the place. Here in our country, uh, having difficulties, uh, following Jesus and worshiping and all of that, and around the world. You know, many of you know I, I have the, the Bible app from Open Doors, and, and I know you do too. And, and every day uh, there's a new story from somewhere around the world where churches are being persecuted and pastors are being persecuted and Christians being persecuted. Christianity is, is, is being attacked, right? Uh, people are concerned about the church, right? I mean, not... not if, Specifically our church, but not excluding our church. They're, they're concerned about the church, particularly the church in, the, in North America. Um, and people are concerned uh, that uh, we have too many you know, protective measures and invasive uh, measures for, for our, our rights and such due to COVID-19. Well, and then there's, there's people that are concerned because we, we don't have enough protective effective measures because of COVID-19. You know, people are they're just concerned about so many different things. In our, in our nation today, uh, people are greatly concerned with civic unrest and, and racial unrest, uh, and people are, are concerned about the propaganda and sensationalism of, of racial unrest, which you know, further divides the country. People are concerned about everything from both sides of, of any aisle that you look at. There's, there's great concern. Um, but I don't particularly, I, you know, I am concerned myself, but um, those aren't the issues that greatly concern me. You know, uh, anyone can see that, that we live in dark times. It's a dark world, uh, globe, global, not just uh, in our nation, but we live in dark times. But uh, the church should shine, and I believe does shine brighter in the darkest of times. Uh, and so as the nation struggles and as the world struggles, uh, the, the church is this place where the peace of God uh, dwells and, and, uh, and overwhelms a heart. 
Uh, it's where hope comes into a life and, and we, can, we can get past the difficulties of today because we have hope for tomorrow and we know who we have our hope in. And so my, my concern isn't so much those things outside, but my concern is, is, is in here, right? Uh, yeah, the dark world is going to be dark and difficult, but the concerns that I have, I, I think, are concerns about the church of God. I want to share with you a quote from, uh, from Reverend James uh, Stewart. He's, a, a, a great, he's from Great Britain a number of years ago, but he said something that, that I think identifies a threat of the church, and I think it will always, one of the biggest threats of the church, this, this is probably key. He said, the greatest threat to Christianity is not atheism, materialism, nor humanism. The greatest threat to Christianity is Christians trying to sneak into heaven incognito without ever sharing their faith, without ever having, uh, ever living out the Christian life, without ever becoming involved in the most significant work God is doing on planet Earth. And I think that's true. That is the, the great concern for the church, right, is that, is that Christians uh, are are so inward focused and we're not outward focused that uh, we, we, we rarely share our faith with the world because we believe that they don't want to hear it uh, and, uh, and we rarely live our life boldly for Jesus Christ because we believe that they don't want to see it um, and we rarely participate in the work of God bringing people into the kingdom because, uh, because we think people again uh, you know, would resist that and don't want to, don't want to hear that. Well, that's one of the reasons why we've been in this series. So this is uh, week three of our series. We've been doing Follow Jesus. And, uh, and as we, we look at the weeks between uh, Christmas and the crucifixion, that 155 weeks, we're looking at the life of Jesus and how he lived and, and, and the things that he accomplished. And I suggested to you weeks ago that uh, what Jesus spent his life doing is what he wants us to spend our life doing. And so what were those things? Jesus proactively connected with people. He came to earth, put on flesh, right? He went out. The description of his ministry over and over was he preached, he teached, he healed. And he traveled all over and he did these things. We see that Jesus passionately cared for people. Uh, and uh, when Jesus looked at people, he saw their needs. He saw their hurts. He saw who they are. And I told you so many times when we look at people, when I look at people, we look past people because we have our own agenda, our own things that we wish to accomplish that day. And Jesus, when he looked at people, uh, he, he saw their hurts. He saw their needs. He saw who they, who they really were. And Jesus was, pa uh, was, was passionately committed to people. Uh, you and I should be people of, of warriors, prayer warriors, right? Continually, Jesus says, to pray to the Lord of the harvest that he would bring more harvesters into his harvest field. And so this is being committed to loving the lost and being prayer warriors in, in that sense. And we suggested a couple of weeks ago that Christians, following the example of our Lord and Savior Jesus, should go low and get dirty. Right? We should get our hands dirty. We should be prepared to wrap the towel around, roll up our sleeves, and, and get to work, get busy. And we see that in doing that, Jesus himself surrendered his power. Right? He leveraged the power that he was given for others. And we, too, are to leverage the, the power, the influence that we have, the authority that's been given to us, not for ourselves, but for others. And we see that Jesus uh, passionately served others. Uh, the church should be a place where uh, the needs of the needs of others are elevated above our own, and we seek to, to, to bring the gospel to, the, to a lost world. Um, basically, we see that... Uh, when we see people, when we uh, connect with people, when we care for people, when we serve people the way Jesus did, the church shines its brightest. Uh, the reason why we, we need to see people the way that Jesus saw people and the way that he served people and the way that he loved people is simply this, so that we can influence people. That really is the, the, the goal, isn't it, to influence people? You can't argue that the... The person who had the greatest influence in mankind, right, is Jesus Christ. You can't argue that. When you look at uh, the influence he had in the world, uh, Jesus is still today is making a greater impact than, than anybody else. When you consider some of the world's greatest names, Socrates, he taught for 40 years, all right? Um, Plato taught for 50 years. 
Aristotle taught for 50 years. Jesus taught for only three years. And you just can't dispute that in, in three years, Jesus made a greater and a more lasting impact on the world that we live in today than those three great minds with their, what, combined 140 years of teaching. Jesus, in just three years, made such an influence in the world today. Uh, although Jesus never painted a picture, some of the greatest artists in all of the world painted pictures, were inspired to paint pictures of Jesus and of his ministry, and they didn't even know what he looked like. Uh, some of the, the world's greatest poets and authors uh, wrote about Jesus. Some of the greatest poets and authors were inspired to write about his work and his life. Uh, Jesus never, uh, he never composed uh, any musical piece. He never wrote a song. But some of the greatest composers of the world, from Beethoven to Bach, have, have created works of art to, to lift up the name of Jesus. They're inspired to sing and to, to create music to bring honor to Jesus' name. And so it's, it's without doubt that the most influential person in all of the world's history is Jesus Christ. And if we're to live like Jesus, if we're to follow Jesus... Uh, we should be influencing our culture, our neighborhoods, our families, our schools, our workplaces. All right, that really is the, the goal of what it is to follow Jesus. Um, I think the greatest sermon ever preached, in my opinion, uh, in that sermon, Jesus gives us uh, what it is. Uh, it gives us the means for how you and I can influence our world today in a way that could could make eternal changes in the lives of, of people who hear us. And so I'll invite you this morning, would you open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 5? Matthew chapter 5. Uh, Matthew is the first book of the New Testament. It's the first of the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that, uh, that were written, a, a mini autobiography of the life of Jesus. And, uh, and in Matthew's Gospel this morning, we're going to chapter 5. Uh, this is... This is what is commonly called uh, the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount. It's, I think, one of uh, the best messages ever preached. Um, before we get started today, though, let me just simply share this. That I, I think it needs to be said. Some people are already thinking, uh, well, this isn't for me. Um, I, I, I don't influence anybody. I don't have an audience. Um, nobody's asking my opinion. And so this, this really isn't for me to be an influencer of, of my world. Well, before we look at the words that Jesus said that day, let's take just a glimpse at who he was talking to that day. And so Jesus is talking to, um, he's, he's giving this message in this area called Galilee. All right, Galilee is this rural backwoods area um, when people speak of Galilee, even in the Bible, it's never in a good way, right? Uh, Jesus wasn't speaking that day to, uh, to uh, you know, scholars in Athens like Socrates and, and so on and so on. All right? He wasn't talking that day to, to Harvard Business School graduates. He wasn't talking that day to a crowd full of PhDs. He's, he's on the side of a hill, and he's preaching to thousands of people who are ordinary country Ordinary country book. And I think if we had been there that day, and Jesus said, the message he says, you are the salt of the earth and the light of the world. And I think if we had been there that day, you probably would have saw all those ordinary country folk look to their left and to their right, maybe behind them, and then look to Jesus and mouth the words, are you, you talking to me? Are you talking to me? Um, I, I'm, a, I'm a fisherman. I'm, I'm a farmer. I've never been to school. I can't write my own name. And, and you think that I am the, the salt of the earth and the, and the light of the world? And not only was he talking to them, but because they believed him, you and I are here today. Because they believed him and because they went out and they were the salt of the earth and they were the light of the world, we now have Christianity in every continent on the planet. And so if you're here today and you're thinking, I'm not an influencer. Right? This, is, this isn't for me. Let me tell you, when Jesus was talking to people, he was talking to people who were on the, the lowest socioeconomic 
uh, class that you could think of. They were the bottom rung of the ladder. And yet Jesus is, is telling them, you can be the salt of the earth. You can be the light of the world. And so I do believe that this message is for you and I today. I believe this message is relevant for us today. You are the salt of the earth and the light of the world. Um, the, uh, so here we, here we go uh, in, our, in our text today. Um, here's the, the premise that I'll throw out here for us today before we look in, into our text. I believe Jesus is simply saying, um, if you follow me, right? If you, if you do what I teach, if you do what I tell you, if you become who I tell you to become, right? If you follow me, you can change your world. And so our premise is we can make this world that we live in, our culture, our neighborhoods, our families, right? We can make this world that we live in a better and a brighter place if we just follow Jesus. If we look to the example that he, that he lived out before people, if we listen to the commands that he's given to us, if we believe the things that he said, um, we can change the world that we live in. How do I know that? Because I can look back into history and see the world that they lived in, and it has changed so much. We're not satisfied with where we're at as a society, as a culture, as a nation, as a world. We're not satisfied where we're at. We want to be better. But you can certainly, without doubt, look back, and you can say we are way not where we used to be. All right? And so I think if we continue to look to Jesus and follow Jesus, our world will get better and better and better as we bring the influence of Jesus into our relationships. And so our first, our first thing, I think Jesus teaches two things in this text. Um, listen, if you're here today, you can do these two things. Right? You might be a brand new Christian. You can do these two things. You might be, uh, Annalise is 11 years old. You can do these two things, all right? You could be 92 years old, right? You can do these two things. Uh, Bob, you're not yet 92, but you're <laughs> on the way. On the way to 92. Hey, what, are your mom's what, 101? 102. 102, all right. So, uh, hey, your mom can do these two things. So the first, the first thing that we see in, in our text today is that we need to show a godly life. Right, we need to show a godly life. This is, this is what Jesus says. He begins this, this portion of, of his, his uh, message. You are the salt of the earth. Before we go any further, you're the salt of the earth. Right? Why did, you know, Jesus could have used any chemical compound he wanted because he's Jesus, right? Um, why did he use salt? Why not pepper, right? Um, why not cinnamon? That's got some power to it. Ginger's got some snap to it. He could have used, you know, some... Why, why salt? Uh, actually, when we look at salt, it's kind of a miracle in itself, right? What is salt? You have sodium and hydrochloride, right? Uh, sodium, you take sodium in large quantities, right? It'll kill you. It'll, it'll take your liver out, it'll, or your uh, kidney out, really. It'll, it'll kill you. And kidneys are kind of a vital organ, yeah? Mm -hmm. um, uh, hydrochloric acid, you pour some in your hand, it, 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 it chew right through. Um, you drink a little bit, right? You don't live to tell about it. But I can take those same elements of salt, uh, the sodium and hydrochloride, and I have salt. I've got one of the most useful uh, substances in, in the entire planet, salt. Uh, it's, it's quite amazing that, that he would choose, choose to, to use this, this particular salt. Um, salt in our day, it's, it's, it's a common commodity. You can find it in, in any store. You could probably even find it in a, in a uh, Cumbies probably has salt, right? But uh, in Jesus' day, it was, it was quite valuable. Right? It was quite valuable. In fact, in certain places, in certain times, you could actually trade salt ounce for ounce with gold. Right? It was that valuable in certain places and in, in certain days. Um, and so why is it so valuable? Salt was a, a preservative. Right? Um, as a matter of fact, it, it was so valuable that uh, uh, it was often used to pay Roman soldiers uh, for their their service, um, salt was uh, not always, but often uh, used to, to. Well, we get the word salary from the um, the Latin word salarium, right? And the the root word of that is salt or salt, right? And so it's it's it has value. But in fact, in, in ancient times, uh, when the Roman uh, soldiers were paid in, in money, they were paid in an amount of money that was equal to what you could buy. Salt for it. Why? Because salt was an expensive but essential commodity in their day. And remember, 
where we're at in our text today. All right, we're in Galilee, this, this backwards place. Um, and what do you think the, the industry was in Galilee in Jesus' day? Right? It was fishing. And so salt was, he said, do you think it was salt was important to a fisherman? I mean, they couldn't live without it. How would they get their goods to market, so to speak? If you were taking your fish anywhere outside of the city where you caught it in, it was packed in salt, preserved, so that it could arrive where you were able to sell it and make a living. All right? Salt was essential in their day. Um, and so what's Jesus telling us here about the salt? I, I believe he's, he's telling us that, that we can be that person of influence if we... Uh, if we are the salt of the earth, if we just, uh, you know, shake out like salt shaker, if we shake out the, the, uh, the, the truth of the gospel, if we, if we live a life in such a way that it brings uh, a, a preserving agent to the conversations that we're in and the families that we're in and the, co the workers that we uh, work with, I think we can, uh, we can bring uh, uh, a, a preserving factor there. Um, so after... By the way, salt is, is so powerful. You, you can't, can, can somebody tell me what salt tastes like? <laughs> exactly, right? Uh, it is so unique, you know, it has its own, it has its own description. So what's salt? It's, it's salty. Right? You can't simply say, well, it's not pepper. That's not very helpful at all, right? Salt's not pepper. Uh, no, it's not. Um, but, uh, but the fact is, if, if you go to lunch with, with, uh, with the person that you're sitting with today afterwards and, and you order your food, your food comes and it's too salty, nobody has to tell you that, right? You know right away, ooh, this is too salty. Uh, if your food that you get comes and it's, it's not, it doesn't have enough salt, it's just too bland, you know, like, ooh, this needs salt. Um, salt in itself is, is just an amazing thing. It, it, uh, uh, it's a powerful thing. Jesus... Uh, I think Jesus is saying that, that when we're around other people, uh, when we're out in our communities, we're in our families, uh, other people should be able to, to taste the difference in the life of a follower of Jesus. Right? We should be spreading out, salting. Uh, just like when you put salt in a food and you work it in, it works its way through the food and it makes your whole, your whole uh, uh, food better. Uh, your life in your community, in your family, right? they should be able to taste the difference in your life because you're a follower of, of Jesus. All right? They shouldn't have to ask if you're a Christian. Uh, just by the words that you use and the conversations that you either participate in or, or don't participate in, by the attitudes and the actions that you have, the ethics that you live by, nobody should have to ask, oh, are you a Christian? As a matter of fact, I know that you've been there before because it happens to me all the time. Right? I'll be in the presence of somebody and I can spend five minutes with them and I'll, and I'll say, I think that person is a follower of Jesus. Why? Because, this, because they were the salt of the earth to me in that moment. Right? I didn't have to ask them. It was because the life they were living, the words they were using, the attitudes that they have in, in the, in the, the uh, uh, communications that we have. I'm like, there's something different about this person. They were a follower of Jesus. And many times if you ask them, uh, that will be the case, that you'll, you'll know for sure. Well, Here's, here's the problem, I think, with the church today. We heard the first part, right? We're to be salt. But did you get the rest of that phrase? We're to be the salt of the earth, right? The salt of the earth. Not the salt of the church. The salt of the earth. I think too many times when we're in our, our holy huddles and we're together and we're spending time in God's word. And, and you see it in small groups as we, as we help to, to process what God is saying in, in those groups. You know, we have, we're, we're salt to each other. Um, but what Jesus said, you're, you're the salt of the earth. Um, it's one of the reasons I'm not concerned about what happens out there, culture out there. I'm concerned about what happens here with the body of Christ because we're called to transform the culture out there. We should be living in a manner that people out there know that we're followers of Jesus Christ. And so one of the things, the concerns I have uh, is that the Christians are too often the salt of the church. Um, and yes, there's a place, like there are people who are here and they're hurting and they need your ministry. But we're called to transform the world. And so we need to be the salt of the earth, not the salt of the church. Um, you, could, uh, you, could buy, uh, a, you could go out to the store today and buy a, a container of salt. I don't know why, 
but salt seems to come in like a five-year quantity. Um, I, I don't know why they do that, uh, but uh, you've seen the, the big round blue containers of the girl in the umbrella. I don't know what that is, but, uh, but it seems to last forever, the, you know? And you notice when you're, when you're at home and, and it's like empty. How could this be empty? Isn't this the thing that Elisha used to fill oil? It just never stops. Um, it, salt comes in these huge things. You could buy the best table salt out there. And I could put it right next to my food. And do you think that that's going to make my food taste any better? No. The fact is salt has to come out of the container and go into the food, onto the food, into the food in order to make any difference whatsoever for the food. Do you think having salt in Jesus' day made any difference to the fishermen? Not if they didn't apply it to the food that they were trying to preserve and, uh, and send out. And so we can't be the salt of the church. We've got to get out of The church is the salt shaker, right? The congregation, the followers of Jesus, you're the salt of the earth. You've got to get out of the salt shaker and into the earth. Um, you know that salt container sitting at your shelf at home? It's not doing any good, right? It's just in a container. If you don't take it out, um, well, where are you today? You say, well, I'm at Commons Baptist Church. I'm sitting in a pew. No, you're on a shelf right now. But when we leave here today, we need to be poured out into the earth. Let's not be, uh, let's not be the salt of the church, right? We do want to minister to the needs of those on our left and our right. We want to love them like Jesus did. We want to serve them like Jesus did. But we've been called to transform our world. And if we follow Jesus, the example that he gave us that we've looked at over the last few weeks, right, then, then that will draw us out to love the lost and to serve the lost and to uh, connect with them. When we leave here today, we want to make sure that the world out there knows that there's a difference in our lives. And that difference is Jesus. Um, so uh, Jesus continues his statement. He says, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has become tasteless, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under, uh, I'm sorry, and trampled underfoot by men. So what's Jesus talking about there? Well, uh, uh, you know, people in Jesus' day in this particular time, they got much of their salt from the Dead Sea. Um, uh, you're familiar with the Dead Sea, often called the Salt Sea. Um, the Dead Sea has uh, waters that flow into it, but no waters that flow out of it. And so it just sits there. And so as the sun beats down on the sea, it evaporates the sea, and it leaves behind salt deposits and minerals, and that is collectible. The problem with this is there's enough salt in that salt to preserve food, but there's enough other minerals and such that it really, really tastes bad. All right. Use memory. You can go to the Dead Sea today. You could see this area where Jesus was was, was ministering. Uh, you could go to this area and you could see the salt deposits that, that line uh, the shores and whatnot. You can even taste it, although I, I don't recommend it because it really is bad. Um, but there's there's enough salt in there to preserve things, but it, but you wouldn't want to eat it. And so, what do you do with salt that you don't want to consume? And so, what do you do with that? They would they would literally. Toss it on the roads. It would help keep the dust down because there was, that's how they traveled. Um, also, if you had a home that you would uh, – uh, some homes had roofs that they would use for patios of such, and, and people would put salt up there, and the dew and the rain would cause that salt to solidify. It would plug the leaks and stuff. It was really handy stuff. Right? Um, but, but that's what they would do with the, uh, the salt. They would literally – uh, cast it onto the, the roads because it wasn't good to eat. It wasn't pleasing. There's nothing attractive about that salt. It's not the table salt that you and I enjoy today. Well, I believe that Christianity itself uh, will, will lose its flavor. Um, the church will lose its attractiveness if we're not the salt of the earth. If we continue to be the salt of the church, um, then our neighbors, our friends, our coworkers, Right? People will look at Christians and say, that's just not, that's not relevant. Um, there's nothing about the life that, that I see that you're living that would make me get up early on a Sunday morning and come to church and hear what you have to say. And so it is important that we really are the salt of the earth and not the salt of the church. When, uh, when the church goes along to get along, uh, 
then we've lost our saltiness. When, uh, when the, the church is, is too concerned about rocking the boat, too concerned about being politically correct, then biblically correct, the church has lost its, its saltiness, right? And we're not attractive to a world. There's nothing about us that, that makes us different. When, when we, the life that we live doesn't look any different than the life of our lost neighbors, the church has lost its saltiness. And so we, we really want to continue to uh, try to live like Jesus. I believe we've said before in our church, followers of Jesus make followers of Jesus. I think it's going to be really difficult for followers of Jesus to make followers of Jesus if we don't look more like Jesus. And so what, did, what were the things that Jesus did? He came, he went, he loved, he served. It needs to be the, the attitude and the action of our, of our church. If preachers today fill their pulpits and they simply say everything that culture says, if they simply say everything that the Supreme Court says, if they simply say everything that, uh, that is uh, in, the, in the news, and, and that's what we're proclaiming from, from the pulpit, um, then I think the church is going to be empty. And I, I also think the church ought to be empty if, if churches around the globe is just doing what the community does. Right? We have to follow Jesus. We have to bring the gospel to a lost and fallen world. It is the job of the church. We need to show a godly life. Second thing that we see in, in this text here is that we need to uh, shine a godly light to others. We need to show a godly life to others. We need to shine a godly light to others. It's not, just, it's not enough that we would live for Jesus and, and keep the light of Jesus hidden. right? If we just live and we try to follow all of the rules that we find in the Bible, um, but yet we keep the light of Jesus hidden, it's not enough to just live for Jesus. We need to shine a godly light into the world. This is what Jesus says next. He says, you are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Uh, what does light do? Light dispels darkness. Light casts out darkness. Light overcomes darkness. Um, it doesn't take a genius to know that, that we're in a dark world, right? Uh, racial unrest, uh, civic unrest, uh, persecution of the, of the church. Uh, we have COVID-19, right? Uh, areas of the world, mil militant Islam, I told you I get these messages every day where, where Christians around the globe being persecuted. It doesn't take long before we know that we're living in a, in a dark, dark world. Right? And, and we look at the, the, the news today, and it's easy to say, ah, this is bad. Right? This is bad. And I agree with you, that's bad. But from a Christian perspective, right? let me tell you, there's a sliver of good in there. Right? And that is because when things are the darkest, light shines the brightest. When the world around us gets darker and darker, if we're following Jesus, the church should shine brighter and brighter. We would be the beacon of hope. You look at Cape Cod is, is famous and, and other areas of the world famous for lighthouses. Right? Uh, lighthouses in the daytime, they didn't, they didn't do much. But when things got their darkest... Those lights were life-saving. And so uh, the church, as the world gets darker and darker, the church should shine brighter and for, brighter for Jesus. People in our neighborhoods, in our communities, in our workplaces should see that's a place of peace. That's a place of hope. Um, I want to be there. Uh, and, and I think that that would happen if we follow Jesus. Um, he says, a city on a hill cannot be hidden. You know, in Jesus' day, many of the buildings were built with white uh, uh, sandstone. Well, in the heat of the day, in the brightness of the day, those things just gleam, right? You could see them from far, far away. And the people who lived there at night would often light oil lamps uh, to light the surrounding areas. And so cities literally couldn't be hidden. And uh, in today's day and age, when we're building, we're digging deep and we're building foundations in Jesus' day, Right? When a city was conquered, the next city was built right on top of it. And so over the course of time, layer after layer, cities get higher and higher. How can you hide a city that's built higher and higher with lights shining at night and the sun you know, making it gleam during the day? Cities can't be hidden. Right? Uh, and, uh, and that's what Jesus is saying there. He says, uh, you are the light of the world. The city on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand. And it gives 
light to all who are in the house. Now, we're, we're blessed today. Every one of us are blessed. We, have, we all have lights in our house. Right? There are areas in the world that's not true, but we're blessed. We all have lights in our house. Why do we do that? Well, we do that because we don't want to sit in the dark. Right? We don't want to stay in the dark. Well, likewise, right, uh, we're to bring the light of Jesus into a dark world. Uh, we're, to, we're to bring the gospel into a dark world. All right? When we go into our, our dark neighborhoods or our dark offices or our dark schools, we're to bring the light. It wasn't God's intention that, that we would go into these dark areas and, and just say, you know what? I'll sit here with you. Right? That was never God's intention. It wasn't God's intention that you would have the light of Jesus and go into darkness and just cover that. Right? Um, no. He says, rather, you, you put it on a lampstand, it brings light to everybody in the house. All right, we're to shine for Jesus and bring light to everybody that we come in contact with, right? Um, how do we do that? So how does, how does the church shine for Jesus? We've been talking for weeks about many different ways that is. We can shine for Jesus with living a life of humility, right? Coming, it just... It, Believing in our hearts, right, and, and behaving as though our, our lost neighbors were more important than us, right? It's more important that what, than what I'm doing, that they know Jesus. Uh, it's another way for, we, for us to shine is to, to go and, and proactively connect with them, right? How, how do I shine the light of Jesus? I, I have to talk to my neighbors, right? I have to connect with those people. I have to share with them right, who we are and, and our faith. We have to be good listeners. Remember, I said Jesus... Or, or, uh, or I don't know who, who wisely said it. We have two ears, one mouth. We need to be good listeners. We need to talk to our neighbors. We need to see them as Jesus did. When Jesus saw them, he saw their hurts. He saw their fears. Or he saw their concerns. We need to, we need to do that. That's one of the ways that the church uh, shines bright. We need to be committed to, to uh, uh, loving our, our lost neighbors. Are you, have you been praying for someone to come to know Jesus? Right, on a regular basis for any length of time. Who's on your prayer list? Right? That's, that's one of the ways I think we can shine is when we commit to loving those in the dark, connecting with those in the dark, caring for those in the dark, serving those who are in the dark. All right? This is how the church shines for Jesus. Uh, another way the church shines for Jesus is proclaiming the gospel. All right? Bringing the, the, uh, the gospel of salvation into our conversations. You know, so many times when I talk to uh, people, I... When they're sharing the gospel, right? Jesus came, he, he bore our sins on the cross, he died, he rose again, right? When they're sharing the gospel, you know what they always leave out? They always leave out that pointed question at the end, the uncomfortable question at the end. Do you believe this? Would you like to be a follower of Jesus today? And so how do I shine the light of Jesus? I bring the gospel into the world, and then I ask for a response Right? Invite them to, to respond to the gospel. Invite them to church. Invite them to your small group Bible studies. Right? Invite the, the, the uh, lost to come into a place where they'll know Jesus. And then continue to pray for them. Maybe even ask them how, how you can pray for them. That's one of the easiest ends for having a conversation with a lost person. Is asking, how can I pray for you? Almost never will you get a negative response. How can I pray for you? Um, so we can all do these two things. We can be poured out like salt. We can shine uh, the, the, the light into the world. Remember, Jesus is the true light of the world. Right? If you have Jesus in you, then you have a light to shine. Uh, uh, let's, uh, I'll wrap up with this question. Uh, what is the most important light in your house? You know, I, don't, I don't think it's what you think it is. <laughs> the most important light in your house. You know, what's more important? That that you know, huge shiny chandelier in the uh, in the, the foyer or the entryway of your house, or that tiny little night light that keeps you from breaking your neck at three o'clock in the morning on your way to the bathroom. <laughs> All right? I have this LED night light right outside my bathroom door, and it has got me through the night faithfully, day by day by day. All right. Um, and so the, the tiniest lights can actually be the, the most uh, uh, brilliant lights in, the, in our houses. Um, and what's, the, what's that? It just simply means it's not how beautiful you are. It's not how brilliant you are. It's do you shine 
for Jesus. Um, so uh, one more thing before I, I have, a, I'm going to ask the deacons if you'll uh, close the blinds and uh, and uh, first if you could close those blinds. D, could you close that door back there? And uh, flip the lights off for me. I don't want you to be intimidated by, by darkness. Um, darkness never overcomes light. Darkness never overcomes light. Light always overwhelms darkness. When, when uh, sometimes the light does, you know, retreat, it dims, it's, it's removed, and darkness fills a void. That's what darkness does. But when light comes into a room, it, it overwhelms darkness. Darkness retreats into the cracks and crevices where it hides. Now, this tiny little light has been shining the entire service, and I bet nobody noticed it. But when things get the darkest, the light of Jesus shines the brightest. And so that's what I want to tell you today. If you and I will follow Jesus, you can bring the lights up, Dave, thanks. If you and I will follow Jesus, as, as things in our world, in our culture, seem to get darker and more difficult, if we're following Jesus, if we're the salt of the earth, and we're the light of the world, right, the church will shine bright. And, uh, and that's my hope for you today. Would you join me in a quick word of prayer as we uh, wrap things up? Jesus says this, and this, it, it needs uh, you know, no clarification. He said, let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Um, isn't that what we've been talking about for the last few weeks? Isn't that what we've been talking about um, you know, this morning? That the church should live in such a manner that, uh, that the world that we live in, the place where we work, the place where we play, would see Jesus, see the light of Jesus, and would glorify God, right, because of, the, because of his church. Now, there was a boy, and he asked his dad, he says, Dad, how tall am I? And the dad says, well, last time we went to the doctor's son, I think you were probably uh, just under four feet. You're probably four feet tall by now. Um, he says, well, Dad, how, how tall was Jesus? Well, the Bible really doesn't tell, son. I don't know how tall he was, but I know back in those days, men were shorter than they are today. He was probably five and a half feet tall. Why do you ask? He said, well, Dad, if, if I'm four feet tall, and Jesus is five and a half feet tall, and Jesus is in me, wouldn't he be sticking out? <laughs> uh, that's pretty good theology for a little boy, don't you think? Uh, hey, if Jesus is in you, shouldn't he be sticking out? Let's pray. Um, listen, if, if, if you're here today, you, 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 haven't, you haven't been uh, born again. You haven't uh, been a Christian before. You're just here today, and you're here maybe for the first time uh, that, uh, that, that God loves you. And uh, I just want to invite you today, if, if, if you want to be a part of God's family, Right. Uh, if you would like to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, as your Lord today, maybe you just pray a prayer like this, just quietly in your heart to God, not to anyone else, not to me, just you and God. Maybe you want to pray something along these lines. Thank you, God, for demonstrating your, your love for me. Even when I was in rebellion against you, when I was living my own life, living for myself, I acknowledge that I am a sinner. I need your forgiveness. I believe that Jesus paid for my sins on the cross. I believe that Jesus is God in the flesh. And I confess with my mouth, Jesus is my Lord. I believe in my heart that he was raised from the dead by the power of your Holy Spirit. Please help me, Lord, to turn from my own ways and to turn to you and to live for you, to be the salt and the light in the world today. Well, maybe you're already a follower of Jesus today. Would you pray with me? Thank you, God, for giving me your Holy Spirit. Lord, help me to follow Jesus. Help me to be the salt and the light in my circle of influence, in, in my friends, in my, my neighborhood, in my workplace. Help me to live in, in such a manner that the world around me sees Jesus sticking out of me. 
and gives you glory. I pray it in Jesus' name, my thanksgiving. Amen.
you'll slip your mask back on and we will dismiss from the rear of the sanctuary. If you will not meet in the center aisle, let alternate aisles go. If you go right out to the parking lot, feel free to uh, fellowship out there in a socially distancing manner. God bless you. Go forward, be salt and light from this place.